Hello everyone, welcome to the BBJ's Virtual Enterprising Women event. I'm Rhonda Pringle, Market President and Publisher of the Baltimore Business Journal. We're glad you've successfully logged in and are able to join us this afternoon. This is not the way we expected to be celebrating one of our favorite events, but we are excited, virtually or not, to bring you the same authentic panel conversation that makes this event so rewarding. I'd like to thank our partner sponsor, Keswick, our association sponsor, Tedco, and association partner, Crew Baltimore, for their work and support for women-owned businesses and female-led companies. In today's issue of the BBJ, be sure to read about these and other local business women who have not shied away from their talent or their innate ability to lead and further crack the glass ceiling for the next generation. While we continue to see significant improvements for women in business, change has been slow. The list of women first is still being compiled. Women comprise nearly half of the U.S. labor force, but still hold just 5% of the CEO positions in Fortune 500 companies and comprise just 22% of seats on corporate boards. This is why I'm proud the BBJ's women-owned business list spotlights 50 successful companies making $2.5 million or more a year. Share your support and congratulations by using the hashtag BaltBizEvent on your social media. You can also type in your congratulations in the questions box and we will share throughout the discussion. Here are the rankings of this year's list makers. Congratulations to all of our list makers. We hope to see you in our list makers lounge after the panel discussion. Today we have a chance to listen to, learn from, and celebrate women who currently face the ultimate test of leadership during these challenging times. Women whose voices need to be heard now more than ever. Please join me in welcoming the BBJ's Editor-in-Chief, Joanna Sullivan, as she and our esteemed panel discuss this year's theme, Maintaining Your Balance. Thank you, Rhonda. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. This is my favorite BBJ event of the year. It's typically held in a grand ballroom with hundreds in attendance. Coffee, breakfast, and gr lots of great conversation are usually the order of the morning. Well, I can promise you lots of great conversation today. Sorry about the coffee and breakfast. I uh, hope you were able to enjoy that already. If you're like me, you've been making lots of it and food in general during these many months at home. At the same time, you're trying to balance work and real life, whatever that is anymore. The two seem to blend a bit too much and time doesn't really mean anything anymore. So today we're gonna to find out from our four enterprising women panelists just how they're maintaining that balance through what is one of the toughest times in their careers and lives. They have a lot to share. Perhaps you'll come away with a little bit more equilibrium. We received some Questions from the audience, we'll also try to address those during our conversation. So first, let me introduce this year's great panel. Joining us today, we have founder and owner of Clavel, W.C. Harlan, and Fadensonen, Lane Harlan. Hello, thanks for having me. And next, we have interim CEO, the Maryland Technology Development Corp, also known as TEGCO, Linda Singh. Welcome, Linda. Thank you, it's so nice to have you. It's great it's to so see nice you. It's so nice to be here. <laughs> <laughs> and recently appointed president of the Downtown Partnership of Baltimore, 
Shalonda Stokes. Hello, thank you for having me. Thanks for joining us, Shalonda. And last but not least, we have Julia Marcieri Alexander, who is the head of the Walters Art Museum. Julia, Hi. thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you. This is great to be here with all these amazing women. So I thought we'd start just asking the question, tell us a little bit about your life in this bubble for the past five months. I was wondering, Lane, if you could tell us a little bit, and you probably have not been in one because you're, you're, you've been working at your restaurants, but tell us a little bit about your life in quarantine. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I didn't get the chance to quarantine. Um, and uh, it was sort of just hitting the ground running once the, the governor came in and said that all restaurants had to close down. Of course, the warning signals were there because I was having management meetings and people were starting to feel very uncomfortable looking at all the things that were happening in Europe and in Asia, across the world in general. Um, we basically, our number one thing was just to figure out how do we protect the people that we know are the most vulnerable financially? How do we keep those people working but safely? How do we pivot our model, which is based on socializing and volume and lots of people and how do we pivot that into a more streamlined carry out model um and so we just closed for one day and then that that one day was uh 24 hours of brainstorming planning and you're also trying to create these new systems and and quickly so that you can reopen with a much smaller crew and a plan to keep everybody paid and for us the thing was Let's charge 20% more on all carryout. Let's take that 20% every week and pull it and give it to all the people not working. Let's do that the whole time. Let's do that. And then once, you know, eventually we got PPP, let's keep those people at home paid. We had a lot of people that, there are certain reasons you can't get unemployment. Also at the time, the website was crashing. People were out of money for a month and a half, two months before they saw a check come in. I mean, it was total chaos. All websites were crashing left and right. Um, so the big move for us was carry out, but carry out with an added 20% built in to pay our people no matter what. So that was non-negotiable. And that was the, the start of how we built the whole program. Well, we're happy and, and pleased that you were able to step away today to, to record this program. Shalanda, tell me a little bit about your crazy life uh, taking on a new job. <laughs> How about that? So you, you, I started um, going into the pandemic as an entrepreneur and came out on the other side as the president of Downtown Partnership. So that's been quite a challenge um, in here, especially because similar to, to Lane, I don't know that we had an opportunity to, to sort of shut down, although things shut down around us. And with Downtown Partnership, we have, uh, you know, one base of our team who can stay at home and work from home and another base that we were able to get deemed essential to help keep downtown, you know, clean and safe throughout this process. So not only are we balancing, you know, sort of the normal sort of COVID things, we're trying to also make sure that we're keeping our team members safe, that we were able to get uh, PPE at a time when it was hard to get and that we are creating sort of this living COVID protocol document that changes daily, right? And so all of that's happening in the midst of, you know, a realization that our tomorrow is going to be different than today. And so there will be impacts on our organization from a financial standpoint, right? And what will we need to do and shift from our team's resources, you know, all of those things, pay cuts, laying people off like all of those are realities of COVID that we're dealing with internally and also helping you know work with our membership to prepare for as well thank you and linda what has your life been like leading pinko from afar <laughs> well i i think um you know when this first started happening i also got appointed to the advisory com committee for the governor uh, I started having to, to really focus in on what were we going to be doing in terms of the response and providing, you know, whatever guidance and assistance that I can. And it's, it's a little, 
little odd because I was in kind of this grouping with all these doctors and I'm just like, well, I'm not one of those doctors. Um, but nonetheless, I also um, started being, I guess it would kind of be like a cheerleader, maybe just the support person for Baltimore and um, the health department and their response and really making sure that I was trying to look out for their interests in terms of what they needed from the state and communicating that back and forth and, and really trying to keep things going. And so that took up um, you know, some of my time. And then when you think about TEDCO itself, um, there were really two key things. Is one, we knew that we needed to keep the doors open because there's so many entrepreneurs that were counting on us. They were counting on us in terms of being able to get that next you know, raise or that next set of seed funding or whatever it may be. And so it was critical for us to be able to figure out how do we stay engaged? How do we stay open and not really be in the office? And what I would say for the TEDCO team is they've done an amazing job. Like they did not miss a beat. Like we quickly threw together a transition plan and said, you know, here's how we're going to operate. Every single team knew exactly what they were going to be doing. And we really tried not to drop anything, right? Because we knew that, yes, we're all going under or, or in a lot of stress, but there's so many other entities that were, you know, kind of counting on us. And then you add into that, um, we have been looking for uh, a new CEO. <laughs> so trying to, you know, start preparing for that transition and we're getting ready, um, you know, here soon to announce, as a matter of fact, we'll, we'll announce tomorrow the new CEO. And so it was all about then keeping the team moving, continuing to set that foundation, continuing to be outward facing, but yet getting prepared for a new CEO to come in. And so it's been a little busy. Um, and what I will tell you is that I do have Kind of something set for myself where I try to take care of myself first thing in the morning. So if you try to hit me up at like between five and six in the morning, I'm usually working out because that's my me time. <laughs> and then I throw some me time at the end of the day where I, I try to settle settle myself down. And so it's been interesting. I am used to, uh, at least not in the last five years, I'm not used to remote working. But previously in my consulting life, remote working was a normal a normal part of what we did. And so it's actually thrown me back into that a little bit and trying to get used to seeing people on a screen versus actually being in an office with everyone. Thank you, Linda. I wrote down, do not bug Linda at 5.30 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> Just a reminder. <laughs> so, Julia, I can bug you though, however, at 5.30 a.m. Um, I, I, yes, always. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you never bug me. So that's that's great. It's always a pleasure to hear from you. So um, we have a great art collection and we steward five buildings as the Walters Art Museum and we have 150 employees. And so on March 13th, when we decided as an institution that we needed to close, um, we had sort of three prongs of, um, of, of work that we needed to needed to do. One was to think about, oh my gosh, what are we going to do about the exhibitions either that are up right now? Thank goodness we didn't actually have any temporary exhibitions with art from out of town on view because that would have been a huge issue. We would have just had to make those dark. But we did have an exhibition that was due to arrive. The objects were due to arrive in the building in two weeks. So we had to, it was a major international loan exhibition of over 300 objects and we were partnering with another museum. So we had to figure out whether we were just gonna cancel the exhibition or just reschedule it, thinking, you know, not knowing how long we were gonna be closed. So we did that and we postponed that for a year. And we were very lucky because a lot of museums, as I say, did have art in the building from elsewhere that they couldn't move for the next two and a half, three months. So you can just imagine your art gets stuck, your the Louvre and your art gets stuck in Milwaukee or um, no trucks are going in between Washington DC and Dallas to transport art. So happily we weren't in that situation, but that was, that was the most immediate thing that we needed to think about in terms of how are we caring for our program and the works of art that are on view. Um, it's kind of an internal internal um, issue, but we also had a lot of donors to that project. So we then had to call them and say, 
Uh, we're going to have the exhibition. Thank you so much for your support, but it's going to take place in a year. So that was that was another kind of messaging issue that we were very careful about. And um, we have great donors, and they were all just so excited that we didn't say, and we're just canceling it. The second thing was to take care of our employees. 150 people um, depend on us. Baltimore as a city really depends on us as an employer. 73% um, of our employees live in Baltimore City. And everyone, I think it's 95%, um, so making up to the 95% live in the county. So Baltimore City and Baltimore County um, needed us to figure out a way for our employees to stay employed. And we made a commitment that we would continue to pay for as long as possible. And I'm really, really grateful that we are still doing it, thanks to our amazing donors and some decisions that have been made over the last decade um, to build our endowment um, and to spend that wisely. And also thanks to the PPP, we have been able to keep all of our part-time and full-time employees employed fully. So that has been a huge um, a huge concern of ours and really, you know, even though we have essential staff who come into the building, that's a small subset. Um, we have another subset who are working from home. And then we have a third subset who are who are just on admin leave and they are actually volunteering and participating in in the rest of the city, the life of the city as they as they can um, in order to help help um, continue to maintain Baltimore as a as a whole. We're very, very committed to being part of that. And then the third piece um, really is all of a sudden museums across the country and across the world had to completely change their business um, from, uh, as Lane was talking about, kind of a hospitality business that depended on people socializing, having fun, wanting to get an education, go to the museum for an afternoon, take their kids there on a rainy day. Um, we had to go from a largely on-site experience to a fully online experience. So um, we had to turn on a dime from being um, in person, uh, an in-person face-to-face uh, -face place to one where we had to think up new content that we could provide online. We focused primarily on education and school children and activities for um, new teachers, in other words, parents. Um, and then also since then we've been doing a lot of online programming featuring our curators, featuring Baltimore artists who are talking about their work. Um, so again, kind of completely shifting how, not only how we do our work, but what work we are doing in order to continue to fulfill our mission. And wow, it's been, it's been amazing. <laughs> So, and then I have such a great, uh, the, the privilege of working with an amazing set of 150 people plus who just really dug in and, and are doing their work with pride and excellence. And so speaking of staff, you all manage people. What are some of the examples of how you had to change your management style? Or did you? Uh, Shalanda, you wanna start? Yeah, I, I think a couple things. So remember for me, it's new because I'm introduced to a hundred team members or so, right? And so I'm meeting some of them for the first time online in that way. But part of what um, you deem valuable, especially at a time like this is, is human and the human nature of what's happening in the human nature of leadership. And so part of what I know in terms of, of style, I have a natural sort of collective style of leadership. I will make a decision, but I'd like to get the buy-in of my team in the process. I think that part stayed the same throughout COVID, but what I had to make sure that my team felt was that I cared about them throughout this process as well. So often when you're in an environment like ours where we are responsible for giving and doing, you tend to think only client first, like get out there and do this work or make sure we you know, create this program. I needed my team to understand and recognize that their safety was important to me, just as important to me in the process. And so, you know, even as we were building what our schedule would be, which team members could work from home, which couldn't for the, for the team members who couldn't, I, you know, I come in, as you can see, I'm in the office every day so that they know it's not just go do this. I'm willing to do what I'm asking you to do and making sure that we're building in sort of protocols that keep them safe. And so the leadership style is 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 evolving um, in the process as well. It's not even if I said it yesterday, it doesn't mean it's necessarily true today. I'm willing to learn throughout the process along with them. And so it's been 
really great. We've had mostly online. We actually did um, an outdoor team meeting, which was really great getting to have that personal connection as well. But we're continuing to evolve together. Linda, how has your management style had to change? I don't think my management style has really changed um, from what I typically do. Um, what I would say is that I started making sure that I checked in with folks periodically. Um, so especially in the, the beginning, because this was new for everyone. And so I would send out um, a little message and just say, hey, you know, checking in on you, I'm just wanting to make sure that everybody is doing okay. And here's kind of what I'm experiencing, because I wanted them to understand that, you know, the feelings and, and all of the anxiety that they may be feeling, they're not alone, right? So I wanted it to be okay for them to, to know that, you know, it's okay to feel what you're feeling. Um, and so we continued to, you know, making sure that we checked in, we continued all of our meetings, our weekly staff meetings, um, I tried to make sure that they were as up to date on what was going on as possible, not getting ahead of any announcements, but really um, saying, hey, you know, here's some things that we're talking about and that, you know, that we're thinking about. And then um, we started doing um, not every single week, but like, you know, biweekly. And then we kind of tailored it off because everybody thought that it was a little too much. We were doing um, e-happy hours, right? And you didn't have to drink and it wasn't really about the drinking. It was really about the part of just getting together. And so we played, you know, games. So I actually led, um, you know, the team in some different games just to get them thinking about different things. And oh, by the way, getting to know each other, very different than what we do when we're in the office. And as a matter of fact, this week um, on Thursday evening, we're doing another um, e-happy hour. And so I got the idea from another group calling you know, who's Zooming who. So, you know, we're going to go around and actually, you know, talk about some different things that people may not know about us. So we'll give a chance to do that. And then in that second half, I'm actually going to do kind of like a cocktail mixer kind of thing for them. Um, but it's going to be non-alcoholic cocktails. So this is one of the things that I've gotten into of showing them how they can make a really cool cocktail and it has nothing in it, but it actually tastes really good. It tastes like the real thing. And so it's just, you know, a little something a little fun for them to be able to do. And this week is, is a heavy week for them. So, you know, they're getting, they're going to get to, you know, meet the new CEO and um, we've had some other executives transitioning in. So you just have to be sensitive to knowing what people may feel and that, you know, it may not be, you know, even at my level, I try to realize that while it may not be important to me, if it's important enough for them to reach out and they want to have a conversation, and I may not agree with what they're going to talk about. Um, I at least need to listen. And, and I think, you know, that's been huge for this, this team. And so I've tried to continue to do that and not to change my style. Um, I wanted them to see that, you know, I'm consistent no matter what happens. I'm going to steal some of your ideas there for the uh, Zoom happy hours and send your recipes. <laughs> so. I will, absolutely. Lane. Um, how have you managed through this pandemic? Um, I would like to echo some of the things Linda said, actually, and just being sensitive to your people and checking in. Just in general, you know, we went from just being maybe four people that really hard first week where it was just me, the other owner, Carlos, and a couple of people in the kitchen um, to slowly bringing people back and trying to communicate the whole time everything happening. But when you bring people back, um, a lot of people know this, but re restaurants and bars have a very high level of sanitation. There's a lot of logs, a lot of things you have to do. You're serving the general public. You have to be very safe in general. So under COVID, it's just taking that and putting it on steroids. So the job becomes even more difficult because you have to be really careful. And that alone can cause a lot of anxiety on top of everything else happening. Um, for example, this week, we just mandated that everyone needs to start getting tested on a regular schedule and to be showing us the receipts will compensate their, you know, if they need a ride, we'll give them a ride, we'll compensate their medical bills or whatever it costs to get tested and, and so on and so forth, pay them for their time. But, but now we feel that since we've brought back so many people and are now dealing with the general public in the sense that we are 
we have outdoor seating, we're exchanging on a, 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 a deeper level than we were before through carryout. Um, now we're getting people tested. And I think for some people, not everyone goes to the doctor. Not everyone is comfortable seeing a doctor or having them, you know, being poked and prodded with things and things up your nose and all these things are, not everybody is. So it's like, you really have to be sensitive to everyone individually as much as you can and, and take it on a case to case basis and be there to, to help people. Uh, there was a time when people, you know, public transportation was an issue. And I think still it, it, it is a bit of an issue. And we were driving out paychecks to people and, and, and tips and things like that. And I think you just, the leadership style and my management style now is it's similar in the sense that I, I, I ask other people for advice and I, I want to listen to what the people working the most in the position has to say versus telling them what to do. But it's different in the sense that um, it seems more emotional now because being open in general is such an ethical question, something that I've not really come to terms with. And we're in an age of complete uncertainty, but I'm a leader and I'm to be making decisions for the good of the group. And, and I question even myself. So I think it's more emotional and, and it's like, yeah, just more, more sensitivity to taking people on an individual basis. Thank you. Julia, what about uh, managing your 150 people? Have you changed I anything? Have, well, it, it, I'm a very um, uh, in-person person. I have a, a, a desire to see and to talk to people one-on-one -on -one and to walk the building and to have um, time with, with folks, both individually and collectively. Um, and, and that, on the one hand, has actually become easier because you know having an all-staff meeting in a museum doesn't mean that you actually gather all the staff because of the schedules and when people are actually in the building. But in all staff on Zoom, you get almost all the staff. So that actually has been better, I think. Um, but you know, the, the thing that's really missing is that one-on-one -on -one contact, the hallway conversation that can lead to um, your thinking differently, completely differently about a situation. And I think that's what I miss the most, but um, I think it, it is really a moment when just being visible and being empathetic is, is just so important. And so I've been trying to do videos, video um, messages instead of just email messages um, weekly with staff. I haven't been as good as I could be. We've actually had a number of meetings that are all staff meetings and particularly I'll, I'll just say that things were challenging during COVID but they became even more challenging for everyone and to use Lane's really great word, um, they became much more emotional and, and, and just draining um, and traumatizing after the murder of George Floyd. And so connecting together um, in the last month and a half, six weeks, two you know, eight weeks um, by Zoom has felt both completely insufficient and absolutely necessary. Um, and so how, how do we have those meetings? It's not just me talking at them, um, you know, at me at them. It is trying to figure out a way for people to share what they need to share. And um, it really is all about leadership listening and um, allowing space. And I don't know if I'm good at it, but it sure has, it's, it, it has felt so important to be doing that. So I think trying to get everyone off of the hamster wheel of stuff to do and give them space to be um, professionals in a shared context and acknowledge how their personal lives affect their professional lives, um, has been really, really different and challenging and, and important. So what have you learned about yourself, Julia? Um, that there is never enough coffee. And <laughs> <laughs> that there is also never enough good sleep. Um, I, think, I think what I have learned aside from the fact that, you know, I knew that I lived a, and have always lived a very privileged life. Um, I think I, I just am ever more grateful for working with these amazing individuals who care so much about Baltimore and the Walters. And um, so learning how to 
actually ask others to listen um, has been challenging for me, you know, because we're all a bunch of talkers and I, I like to listen, but there are a lot of people that I work with who aren't listeners, they're waiters to talkers. And so um, that's, you know, what I've learned about myself is how to be a better listener and a more humble listener, I think. I hope I've learned that. Shalanda, what have you learned about yourself over these past few months? I've learned that um, it, it's a saying that that's to whom much is given, much is required. And I've learned that I'm not going to be satisfied until I give my everything for to the greatest and the least. Right over over this time, I think when you think about what's happening from a racial injustice perspective. Um, in the COVID, you have a pandemic on top of a pandemic. And unless we are intentional about figuring out how we help all of them, then I will not be satisfied. So I'm going to give every inkling ounce of my body and work to figure out what I can do to help fill that void and do that. And I learned over this time that I won't sleep um I, until i feel like i've given everything i could to help solve that and lane definitely moving forward with more intention um i think that in as, as leaders and, and and having a lot of staff and, and being busy and sort of in this hamster wheel sometimes where we're we're constantly multitasking and and we we you know be because we are good, we, we think we're just automatically doing good and spreading good. But a lot of times I, I feel like I, I've said yes to things or done things, but without the greater intention that I think if I spent more time with, with thinking about a greater intention, thinking about bigger goals as opposed to all these little small achievements, I think I could make um, a bigger impact. I could make a, a greater impact for my people and like Shawana says about the greatest and the least whatever is the least bring the least up to the, be the greatest to be to, to bring the the people that have the least opportunity and look at them and figure out how to make their life better how to make their life uh how to, how to give them the tools they need to be more independent um there's a huge uh chasm between the, the back of the house the people in the kitchen behind the scenes and then the people in the front of the house and there's there are structures that have to be revisited and, and with greater intention, it, it, it's not a time to accept uh, being a part of this industry as it is. The industry has to be put under a microscope and, and completely uh, taken apart in, in all of the ways that, that were not questioned before. So, so yes, what I'm saying is, is moving forward with um, greater intention in the decisions that I make um, on behalf of my restaurants and my bars. Thank you. And Linda, what have you learned about yourself? I, I think um, the biggest thing for me is because I focus in on impact and being able to make a big impact. And during this time, it's the first time um, that I've not been in uniform when a crisis has hit or I mean, it's actually the first time that I haven't been in uniform in 38 years, right, when we've had challenges here in the, the state of Maryland or, or anywhere else. And so it's probably the first time that I felt really helpless and not being able to help others. It's frustrating. <laughs> um, and I felt like um, it was making me kind of be angry in the, the sense that um, I you know, decided to retire when I did because I felt like I could have helped so much more had I still been in uniform. And then, you know, you have to kind of get over that, right? Because I can't do it forever. And so um, I started really just, you know, turning my focus to saying, well, what do I need to now focus on, right? So how do I really start helping to help others come out of this? And, you know, with everything that was going on with the pandemics the first time that you know really any of us have been kind of in this this space right with something like this going on um and just thinking about the anxieties and the mental health issues and just making sure that you know 
I need to start focusing on what am I going to do for my part to help people heal. And when the whole situation with uh, George Floyd hit, um, that threw me back to 2015, to you know what we had going on in Baltimore. So therefore, you go through another whole emotional thing. And then, um, so when you think about it, I, I think for me, I've had to really start saying how am I going to now have an impact in a world that um, we still have significant challenges. It doesn't mean that we haven't made a lot of improvements, but we have significant challenges. And I think the biggest thing is, you know, we've all kind of talked about it is this whole thing of feeling, you know, we have to be a little bit more compassionate and it's that whole side of compassion and empathy and listening that we're going to have to learn how to engage even more. Now that we've been withdrawn, we're going to have to learn how to engage. And I think that's going to have tensions riding extremely high. Um, and so I'm trying to figure out for myself, so what's going to be the next thing that I can do um, within my world, right, within my new world, that's going to add to being able to help us heal um, and not contribute to us not healing. Thank you. So our theme this year is maintaining your balance. And you've already talked so much about how you're trying to juggle it all. Um, you know, we have the pandemic, we had George Floyd's death, we have uh, economic woes right now. How are you dealing with home, work, life in general? Uh, Julia, you want to start? I know you had quite a month with your daughter. <laughs> yeah, so my daughter was diagnosed with juvenile arthritis um, at 13, um, and she's now 16 and a half. And she, on May 26th, um, we were in Philadelphia, and she had a double hip replacement. And, um, you know, so, so as a friend of mine says, you know, there's COVID, there's the museum industry wanting to reinvent itself after 300 years of being exactly the same. There's society needing to reinvent itself. And then your daughter had a double hip replacement at the same time. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think that this is this notion that we're reading a lot about this past week about how um, work from home continues to expose the gender divide that we have in the household and that women tend to, um, women are now working even more than they were before um, and they're teaching their kids and they're dealing all of that. I will say that I have, I, I have an incredible support system with my husband who for once is back in town because he works at a museum in New York, which has been closed <laughs> since March. So, so that was an upside, but, but this balance between what you as a parent, you as a caregiver, um, you as a, an individual, there's a lot of external work that you do. And I think that for me, I have not been good about taking that hour every day and taking care of myself. So I really applaud you, Linda, for saying, you know, five to six, that is my time. That is no one else's time. Because I think that's that's really, really important. And all of us are super compassionate and, um, you know, you don't need to have your daughter getting a double hip replacement to feel like you just can't keep all the plates spinning um, in front of you, you know, and juggling those rods with the spinning plates. Um, but it has been incredibly challenging, and and I f I have found that it's the that you don't have a space to which you can go. You know, home is usually a place where you are not a hundred percent thinking about work, and now home has been infiltrated by that. So that that is just that that has been really hard, and I think we all need to give ourselves a break and support ourselves in the same way that we're trying to support others. Linda, how do you maintain that balance? Oh, I mean, I still have my time, which I exercise. That is crucial for me, because if I don't, then I'm going to be in the doctor's office all the time, or my doctor's going to be yelling at me that I'm not exercising, right? So I try to maintain my exercise. Um, my office, I do try to kick my husband. So when my husband is not working, 
Well, he has a habit of coming in the office and I've had to kick him out of the office because I'm just like, look, I'm on a call. I can't pay attention. So it's like, you know, you need to, you need to go out of my office space. Um, and I do have a space uh, either, you know, one in the yard in the morning where I can just take a few minutes before the day starts to kind of regroup and just enjoy looking because I live in kind of a, a very busy area. So I enjoy looking at the trees and just listening to nature. Um, and then, you know, my daughters have actually got me into a lot of um, the crystals and all of these different things. So I sage at least once a week, and sometimes more. If it's been a challenging week, I sage almost every day. Um, I do things to try to keep my space clean. Um, and when I say clean, I'm talking, you know, the energy. And so um, that really helps me because I find when the energy is heavy and stagnant, it just plays on me, which means then, you know, whoever I'm talking to, it may come across. And so I try you know, not to, not to do that. And so, um, and, and you know what, if I don't get to laundry, guess what? The laundry is going to be there. I'm not having to wear as much as I usually do since I'm behind the camera. So, okay. I don't have to worry about always having everything clean. So it's like, I know that sounds really bad, but it's like, okay, yeah, laundry can get done. So if you let something drop, that is really not that important. Is it that bad? And so that's the thing. It's like, you know, being okay to let something drop because you've got more pressing needs. And that's what I usually do to really help focus in on, you know, taking care of my space, taking care of me. And, and I will tell you, it has been, you know, my husband and I've been married 28 years and it's been extremely challenging, you know, for us, because I'm just like, I don't think we've ever been home together. As <laughs> I'm not sure I like you anymore. We should go back to work, right? So it's like it's like you're trying to get used to, you know, being, being home in a space, and you know, because he kind of works on a, a different schedule. Um, and you know, when he was first off at the same time, I'm like, oh, I don't like this. I don't know what we're gonna do when we completely retire. Um, so I'm trying to get him a hobby and do something else, but. You know, you really have to kind of think about how you restructure and, and kind of reprioritize things. And, and then how do you make it work? And my kids are older, so I'm not saying that I don't have to worry about them. I do have to, to, to worry, um, but it is, it is different because I don't have to worry about the schooling. I don't have to worry about, you know, are we going to do homework or all of the other things. And so that particular piece, I, it's, I'm not going to say easier. Um, but it is it is easy. And I do have three dogs. Now, I will tell you that um, that has been a huge adjustment for them. And you wouldn't think so, but it has really, you know, kind of thrown our household a little bit in, you know, kind of a challenge because they hear me get off of call and they immediately come in and say, oh, it's time for you to play with us. And I'm just like, whoa, OK, I got another call. So, you know, it's taken a little bit of a adjustment. Where are the dogs today? I don't see them. Well, so, well, they were in here and they start barking at odd times. So I texted my other daughter and I said, please come and get them and lock them in the laundry room. <laughs> I just want to tell you that when my husband came home, so he would be gone for a week. Um, he would leave on Monday and come back on Friday. And when he was home during the week for the first three weeks, he actually was under the illusion that we all ate dinner together. And so both of my twins and I were like, yeah, no, dude, that." That it's wrong. We we like to go our own way. So it just that bubble was burst right away. <laughs> That's funny. That is like great advice, Linda. And um, now I know what to do with my sage plant, which is growing crazily. <laughs> besides, cook with it. So, Lane, how have you maintained this balance, or do you have any balance with uh, running these restaurants? <laughs> yeah, I mean. Certainly, I'm. I'm. I've. I've been busy for so many years. I. I've definitely understood that having physical movement be a part of my lifestyle is really important because I'm so up here all the time, and this doesn't turn off either. It's. It's. I'll be home ten o'clock at night, sitting in bed, and I. I want to get on the computer and I want to get it all done, and I have to sort of like snap myself out of it and. I think for me, sort of bringing myself more into my body is 
walking or riding my bike to work. Um, I'm lucky in the sense that I live about a mile from my businesses here in the city. And I think that that jump starts me. That's like a physical exercise in the sense that my heart's going. I can dream a little. Maybe I'll start stop thinking about work for a minute and just zone out. And then the last thing is family. Um, because my job is very social. So I usually, it's social and, you know, even owning bars and having a space that has live music and events, I'm constantly socializing with people and it prevents me from connecting with my family sometimes because when you fill all those spaces, your family sort of get, can be put on the back burner. So in this time, since I haven't been hanging out with friends and such, I've been just spending the night at my parents' house or have my nieces come and stay the weekend with me. and my mother's been teaching me recipes and just things that I just never did before. But that that's so relaxing to have the space for your family and to be present and not be thinking about, oh, I have to run off. I have to go to this event at work or just going to drive out to see your family for only like four hours. And so that's been grounding me like family, nature, moving my body. All these things are keeping me sane and fresh and able to make hard decisions all the time. Yeah. Shalanda, have you maintained some balance and and household. Oh, oh my God, balance is like a dirty word. No, <laughs> I, I think I think I've I've redefined probably what balance means, right? To me, I'm I'm at a point in my life and in my career where everything has sort of culminated into to one thing, right? And so now, similar to Lane, I, I actually live within walking distance from my job, which you know, I would have never thought that would have happened um, and understood the benefits and the pleasure of something like that. Um, with COVID, it's forced sort of a, a slowing down. Although things are speeding up, things have also slowed down and I didn't want to get the actual COVID-19 pounds. And so, you know, we started bike riding and, you know, we are, believe it or not, having dinner together, which we had never you know, in the hustle and bustle of life previously, those things didn't happen in that way. And so, you know, our conversations, you know, are still about work. I, I know I'm similar to Lane, I'm constantly thinking of ideas and ways we can do things different. But I think for me, the balance has come into all of those things aligning. You know, my, my children are engaged in what I'm doing. They're excited about it. They're a little bit older. And so, they're driving similar to Linda. I don't have to worry about trying to do schoolwork and stuff, but I can engage them in that work with the team and you know, and my girlfriends, we're embracing Zoom and actually learning more deeply about each other than we had before on in sort of surface type conversations. And so I, I believe with this, it's given you know us all an opportunity to go back to nature in a way that we hadn't before. We can't just, you know, fly by night and do some of the things. So we have to just think more thoughtfully about how we engage and connect. And I've been able to take advantage of that. So, you know, we're all women here and uh, trying to keep our careers going. What kind of advice do you have to people out there who are, you know, perhaps unemployed, uh, need to look for something new or in a job and they're trying to figure out where to go next like how do you keep that momentum going during this unprecedented time anyone want to go first on that i know for me i'm in the middle of, well i'm getting ready to go through another transition right i seem to be uh, one that kind of stays i hate to say stays in transition but i'm always doing something and I have my my own business that I'm trying to, and I have been, you know, working to gear up. And most of, of what I I do is, um, you know, focused on government contracting. And so it's been a long lead time for things. And so thank God that I happen to be, you know, doing some things with Tedco because it's it's at least given me the time to start gearing that. Um, aspect um, back up and trying to see, you know, where are we going to be with government contracts and, and things like that. And so I am looking forward to hopefully things moving a little bit more. Um, but I would say for, you know, someone looking to get out, I mean, working a new business is, it's probably a great time doing something uh, innovative. This is probably the perfect time, right? Because unfortunately, 
you know, what happens with this is we have a lot of businesses that don't, you know, they don't make it through, but it is a good time to start a business because we need to re-engage. We're going to have to continue to keep this going. And so um, if you are um, able to do some training, it's a perfect time to focus in and maybe do some training for yourself. And so I, and that's some of the advice that I've been giving you know, to other individuals is now that you have a little bit of time, take that time to look at, you know, what can you add to your toolbox? Are there some other things that you can do? And so, um, you know, for, for me, I'm looking at, okay, coming out of this, I want people to have a breakout moment, right? So we should say coming out of this pandemic, coming out of being in, we need to have a breakout moment. So you now need to create, what does that breakout moment need to look like? And it's not breakout from the pandemic. It is let's get out and, and recreate and kind of, you know, gear up something new. And so that's going to be my theme to folks is that, you know, what's going to be your breakout moment coming out of this? And that means that you need to think about something that you're passionate about and make it now the time to do it. I think we all need to realize that life is very short and it can be taken at any given time. So you need to make every moment count. Um, and that has to be not just for you, but for those around you. And so that's kind of what I'm focused on and, and what I would recommend you know, others start doing. Lane, what about you? What, what do you think uh, other women should take away from, from this and as they try to you know, move forward in their lives and their careers? I think that women should just, I mean, I think it's important to really imagine before like all the little steps, like imagine where, visualize where you want to be, visualize what you want your life to, to be like, visualize the things in your life that you feel are non-negotiable, whether it's being close enough to visit your family in your job, you know, or, or, um, you know, working in at night so that you can homeschool your kids in the day or what, whatever it is, like visualize where you want to be and feel that first so that, you know, when you go through all the steps to get there, you know, that you're in it with a full heart, full mind, you're going to work really hard. You're going to do what you need to do to get there. And you're going to basically, it's like, you, you're going to will it. You're going to will it. And I think that I think that things become more realistic when you visualize them or you see them. And it's almost like in every project I've created, it's just been this little like tickle in my head of I'm inspired. Now I'm kind of obsessed. Now I want to share it with the public. How do I turn this thing into reality? And for me, it's like, I just start, I just, you know, whether you're, you're visual or not there, you know, make up a name for it for your business. And now you have a name for it. And now it's real, right? Talk to people about it. Talk to as many people as you can about it. These dreams become realities. We will them. We have to visualize them and 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 focus on them and 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 really go for it. And so I I think you know I guess my best advice is to someone who does want to open up their own business, um, to the way you can really make it real for yourself and hold yourself accountable is like make a mood board, your tire it out, make yourself all your logo. Friends talk to your entire family, talk to all your friends, tell them it's what you're doing, and then go find people in that industry you wanna go into and ask them a million questions. People are so willing, like right now, I'm mentoring people on a weekly basis that just wanna open business, I have a little extra free time, and I'm like, oh, this is something I wanna do, I wanna do it for BIPOC, I wanna do it for, I wanna do it for people in my community that are young and feel like they don't know where to go, and like, that's been really empowering, I feel like both ways, because knowledge is power, and like, we are very experienced in, I think people are afraid to ask questions. They think people like us might not be willing to lend an ear, or lend our time. But if I don't have the time, I'm going to connect you with somebody. That's right. Julia, what about you? Any advice? I just, I think that this notion of um, taking, taking advantage of the networks that, that you can find yourself into, right? That you can, you know, you, you know one person, take advantage of going to talk to that person and then it's like that old Breck commercial and so on and so on and so on. Um, and I think believing in yourself, right? So that you, um, it's really easy to get into a place of, gosh, I don't enjoy what I'm doing now or I'm not doing anything now. And therefore I don't know what I'm gonna do. And so I can't do anything. You kind of get into a frozen place, but you know, you do have skills, you can learn more, you can meet new people and just believe that you are enough 
and that you can you can reimagine yourself or you can reimagine your situation and and I, and I love Lane's idea of just visioning where you want to be um, because this is a moment when you have opportunities or you can look at it as an opportunity to reimagine not just renew yourself and your where you are but really reimagine and um, or even rethink completely. So believing in yourself that you are enough to do yeah. what it is that you choose. So, and you know, that that's easier said than done. But I think it, if you look at it through the positive frame of an opportunity rather than like an opportunity challenge rather than um, a desperate, gosh, I can't do anything. And, and that that's the first step that you have to take. You have to believe in yourself. Right, thank you. And Shalanda, any you know, there? Absolutely. I, I think these phenomenal women have said a, said a lot about it. Um, I know I would first start out with, with telling the person to breathe, right? Right now, this is an emotional time for everybody, people with jobs, people without, and just all. And so, you know, for a moment, you know, not long, depending on your financial situation, but definitely to sit for a minute and, and just breathe. After that, I would I would recommend that they shift to an assessment, right? The the good thing, because I you know I'm a half full, I always try to figure out what the the good can be. But the good thing about sometimes being displaced or some of that is it gives you an opportunity to think about what you really want to do, and and to you know similar to what Linda was talking about, what tools do I need to gain or or look into so that I can help get there to really take a moment to do that. So after I breathe and I assess, my my last bit of recommendation, and this has been, I think what's helped me all throughout is I have this mantra of 100 no's, right? And so that means that within whatever given period of time, be it a week or a month, I have to get to 100 no's. That's meaning I have to ask, probably two or 300 times something to get to 100 no's, which shifts the paradigm of what could feel like rejection, but it also increases the opportunity for success. And so once you decide whatever it's gonna be, it during this time especially, we have to over ask and over ask because you know, it's, it's, you know, we're at a, at a place that we don't have as much as, you know, from an economic perspective, so you make it no, but keep asking, keep doing, keep creating. And, you know, similar to where Lane was, it it will happen. I, I literally believe that you cannot outwork or out effort that kind of change. Well, that's wonderful. I think this is probably a great time to, to wrap up. I could talk to you all day, but I'm not gonna keep you on Zoom and get you tired, but uh, by the end of it. But I want to thank you for all your great advice, for sharing, uh, you know, your personal stories and for sharing your homes and your offices. So thanks so much. Thank, thank you. you. Have thank, a wonderful you. Day. thank you, Joanna. And thank you to our panelists, Lane, Julia, Linda, and Shalanda. I hope you enjoyed the panel as much as I did and got at least one takeaway. I know I'm going to take Shalana's advice about getting 100 no's. Thank you once again to our partner sponsor Keswick, our association sponsor Tedco, and association partner Crew Baltimore for their support of today's program. I'd like to remind all attendees to join us for an informal networking session at the link that was emailed to you earlier. Log in and say hello to your fellow attendees and continue the conversation of how you are maintaining your balance. On behalf of the Baltimore Business Journal and our sponsors, thank you for joining us and have a great rest of your day.